Join the PRS Journal Club. Read the monthly picks and classic pairings on prsjournal.com. Discuss with the authors on Twitter at PRS Journal and listen to the podcast. Hello, everyone. It's September 2018, and I'd like to welcome you to another edition of the PRS Journal Club podcast. I'm Nikki Phillips, resident ambassador from the Harvard Plastic Surgery Program, and I am joined, as always, by my co-resident ambassadors, Francesco Egro from the University of Pittsburgh and Ira Savetsky from NYU. We are honored to have Dr. Jeffrey Janis as our guest moderator this month. Dr. Janis is president of the American Society of Plastic Surgeons, professor and executive vice chairman of the Department of Plastic Surgery at Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center, and an associate editor for PRS. Dr. Janis, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Nikki. Honored to be here. So before we launch our discussion, just a quick reminder that this article, along with every selected PRS Journal Club article, is available for free online on the PRS website. This month's featured article by Yamamoto et al. is entitled Lymph Flow Restoration After Tissue Replantation and Transfer, Importance of Lymph Axiality and Possibility of Lymph Flow Reconstruction Without Lymph Node Transfer or Lymphatic Anastomosis. So this article contains a number of abbreviations and descriptive terms that may be relatively challenging for readers like myself who are still learning about lymphatic reconstructive procedures. But the selected article and video pairings for the article, which can be found on the PRS website, are extremely helpful for understanding both the concepts behind this study as well as the terminology used to describe the findings. The central message of this study is that lymph axiality-based tissue transfer has the potential to restore lymphatic flow to sites where lymphatic channels have been disrupted without the need for vascularized lymph node transfer or lymphaticovenular anastomosis. Using ICG lymphography for both preoperative planning and postoperative evaluation, the authors determined that lymphatic flow was consistently restored when the donor and recipient lymphatic channels were placed into the proper alignment and in close proximity to one another. The authors define two terms to describe these key determinants of successful lymph flow restoration. Raw surface in lymph axiality, or RLA, describes the raw surface area between lymphatic vessel stumps. Compatible lymph axiality, or CLA, was used to describe compatible lymph flow directions of the recipient and donor tissues and or a distance shorter than two centimeters between lymphatic stumps. The study looked at 38 patients who underwent either tissue replantation or free flap reconstruction, followed by ICG lymphography to evaluate postoperative lymph flow patterns. 16 patients underwent replantation, while the remaining 22 had free flap reconstruction of either the upper or lower extremity. All of the replantation cases involved upper extremity digits, with the exception of one penile replantation. In the tissue replantation cases, all surgeries were performed in the standard fashion, without preoperative or intraoperative imaging or specific interventions concerned with lymph flow restoration. For the free flap procedures, 15 of the 22 were performed in a conventional manner, while the remaining seven employed preoperative ICG lymphography to mark out lymph flow patterns in the donor and recipient tissues. Then, during flap inset, When possible, skin edges were aligned so as to approximate lymphatic channels as closely as they could under ICG lymphography navigation. No suturing of the lymphatics themselves was performed. Channels were aligned and approximated using subdermal sutures alone. Of course, soft tissue coverage took precedent over lymphatic realignment, and two of the free flaps performed under this ICG lymphography guidance still could not achieve lymphatic alignment based on the constraints of the reconstructive demand. Lymph flow restoration was observed in 63% of cases overall. Several factors were significantly associated with lymph flow restoration on statistical analysis, but without getting into the weeds too much on the details, the cases with a negative RLA, so a smaller raw surface area between lymphatic stumps, and a positive CLA, so matched alignment of lymphatic channels and or less than a two centimeter gap between them, demonstrated a 100% lymphatic flow restoration rate. Now, this study was small and quite limited in terms of its patient population, and it also looked at two different types of surgery. Tissue replantation, by its very nature, will attempt to reproduce the normal anatomic alignment of lymphatic channels, while free flap reconstruction may be limited in its ability to do so based on the soft tissue defect and reconstructive needs. In my opinion, the use of preoperative and intraoperative ICG lymphography for potential lymph flow restoration is most interesting in those scenarios in which multiple potential flap designs and insets are possible, which of course is sometimes a limited scenario. The ability to channel this potential and downstream avoid lengthy and complex surgical procedures is certainly worthy of further investigation. So Dr. Janice, I'm very eager to hear your thoughts on this paper. 
How should we design the next study to look at this question? And which clinical scenarios do you think the study is most applicable to? I know we've talked about uh, keep or trash, but let me ask this. When we've discussed previous papers, we know that this is a limited study because of a small patient population. However, I think the results were extremely interesting, especially with the 100% ability to restore axial lymph flow when you had the RLA negative and the CLA positive situation. So let me ask you this, just based on this small retrospective review, is this a paper that is going to impact your clinical practice today? This paper? Oh, that's a great question. And I'm, I'm not trying to straddle the fence on this answer, but I think what I really liked about this article is I think it's an idea article. This is an, the kind of article that like leads us to think about, you know, conceptually, can we do this? You know, like, can we harness our free flaps without adding extra stuff to them? But just already what we're doing, we add in some ICG lymphography, which is a huge deal to add on, and we can potentially capture this great effect. So I think I would like to keep this paper right now as an ideas paper. I think as a study overall, it's not a great study. I think we need to do better studies, but that's why I wanted to frame that question to you that way. All right. So Ira, as an idea paper, if you agree with Nikki that it's a good idea paper, what problem is it solving right now? Have you noticed issues in tissue replantation or transfer with long-lasting edema? Have you seen that in your clinical practice and training? I would trash it. I don't think it will change anything right now. I agree with Nikki that it's interesting and thought-provoking, but practically speaking, you know, currently I'm the, I'm the chief on the hand service at Bellevue, and, and I've done a few replants recently, and you know, there's no long-lasting edema on successful replants in the digits. So, you know, at the end of a replant or when you're getting ready to sort of inset it or whatnot, I'm not going to ask for the ICG to try to line up the dermal lymphatics. Francesco, do you use ICG at all in any of the cases that you're doing? Flaps, breast surgery, anything, head and neck? We use it for breast occasionally, uh, and we use PD. So we don't, we don't have SPA here. We use a PD, but we use it in the sun and green. So you do have it. You have the technology, but you don't use it that often. Is that right? We only use it if the flap is compromised. All right. Ira, do you have ICG technology? At NYU, yes. At Bellevue, no. So at NYU, we use it in a similar manner, only if we're worried about flap compromise. All right. Nikki, do you have it? Some hospitals have it and some don't. At some hospitals, we use it on almost a routine basis. And at some hospitals, I have never seen it pulled out ever. And is that attending dependent? I think that's more institution dependent. I think the attendings at certain institutions have decided that they think it's useful or that it's not useful. So I think it's more of a department decision than uh, than individual surgeon decision. All right. So all three of you have experience with it in some way, shape, or form. In some hospitals that you operate in, it is available. In some, it's not. My question to you is, is that if you didn't have it at all, would you buy it or recommend buying it based on this study? Based on this study, no. Okay. Ira, what do you think? Negative. Okay. Francesco, would you buy it? No. Okay. So the thing about this study is I agree with Nikki that this is a great conceptual study. Like for me, it makes me think twice. At least I become familiar with the concept of lymphaxiality. I understand that without the need for super microsurgery or lymph node transfer, that you can just pay attention to orientation of tissue and with dermal suturing can create alignment and possibly favorable conditions to restore lymphatic flow, which nobody's going to argue with. The only thing is, is that in order to do it appropriately, it can't be done by the naked eye. This is something that you would require a supplementary technology for that in this day and age is something to consider. I chair value analysis at my institution here in Columbus for the university. I also have chaired value analysis when I was at UT Southwestern in Dallas. And I can tell you that it doesn't matter where you are. You could be all over the country in any state. 
value analysis is a big deal. It's front and center. If you're trying to get a widget and that widget costs a dollar or more, then there's going to be an evaluation as to whether the juice is worth the squeeze, so to speak, and whether you should get this. So then the real question is, is what's the problem that it's solving? Is the problem big enough that it requires an expenditure to go get ICG if you haven't gotten it yet? And otherwise, you know, what do you do with this paper? So at the end of the day, I like the paper. I agree with Nikki from a conceptual standpoint. I think if you already have ICG and you have concerns over some flaps where there is persistent edema, like I'll throw out there lower extremity reconstruction, I think is one of those that you may think twice about because you do tend to get a lot of persistent edema, you know, in those types of cases, then you already have the technology, you may pull it out of the closet. But would it cause me to buy an additional ICG machine if I didn't have it? Not based on this study. That's kind of where I'm at on it myself. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And it sounds like we're sort of all on the same page with that. Francesco, what were your thoughts on this paper? Just like both of you said, I thought it was very interesting paper conceptually. And, you know, the concept of improving limb flow restoration through axiality has the potential of improving outcomes of free flap reconstruction, especially like Dr. Janice said in the lower extremity setting where edema can be a significant issue. But I felt, you know, it's still an idea. The, the core was too small to draw definitive conclusions. But again, the author should be commended for the innovative concept. I wonder of the practicality of it. Again, Dr. Janice mentioned the cost, but also, you know, whilst I can see uh, having the applications in the extremity reconstruction setting because of the slightly greater versatility and how you can insert the flap, but I think that this would be very challenging, for example, the head and neck reconstruction setting or finger replantation setting, because that two centimeter margin that they describe, uh, you know, you, you can't really just shift a digit to ensure appropriate lymphatic axiality because it's just not feasible. But nonetheless, I think the principle is sound and uh, definitely I look forward to reading more studies on it. And uh, Dr. Janice, I wanted to hear how it could potentially affect the reconstructive outcomes and how do you think it will affect the future of free flap reconstruction? You know, I think it's something to be considered to use more than just in digits, but, you know, in any flap that's prone to edema, I think my next study on this would be a cost analysis study where, again, if you took a look at flaps from all regions of the body and did a, an analysis on those that have a higher propensity to form longer lasting edema due to non reestablishment of, of axial lymph flow, and then took a look at the cost of what it would take to evaluate this and figured out that intersection point where it is worth it to do it, that would be my next study. Because otherwise you're talking about extending the length of surgery, performing more complicated procedures like super microsurgery with the actually express intent of aligning uh, and anastomosing lymphatic channels. I mean, that's gonna have tremendous cost as well. Could we do the same thing without all the fancy stuff, so to speak? That would be an intriguing question to answer. And if it turned out, actually, if you ended up doing uh, even a, a, a randomized prospective trial insofar as that in some cases you purposefully did lymphatic reanastomosis, and in others you just did this kind of close proximity reapproximation with ICG supplementation, and you compared outcomes of those two cohorts of patients, um, it would be an interesting finding to see what was better and actually what was more cost effective because those are two different questions too. So I think that that would be my next study and where I'd take it from there. That would be really, really interesting. At that stage, then depending on what the outcomes are, then potentially change or consider as a changing our practice. Ira, what were your thoughts about the paper? I agree with everything that was discussed and I agree it's a thought-provoking study. I don't think it's a practice changing study just yet. I think the things to think about also is the location where tissue is being transferred and the size of the tissue being transferred. I would presume that if you're transferring tissue to the axilla or groins, which are high demand locations for lymph drainage, I'm not sure that without transferring lymph nodes that there'll be adequate dr drainage. In addition, you know, we often think about lymph nodes and lymphatics as just purely plumbing. But, you know, lymph nodes do play a role in immunity 
and they also play a role as sort of an endocrine system as well with secretions of cytokines like VEGFC. So I think all those things would be interesting to look at in a larger, more granular study. What are your thoughts about size, location, Dr. Janice? And, and you know, on the one hand, I think if, if a digit is being replanted, that the lymph drainage demand is relatively small, whereas if you're transferring a larger flap, there'll be sort of a higher demand of lymph drainage. But at the same time, I do feel like even if you don't use ICG, you're more sort of likely in a larger flap to line up some dermal lymphatics and there will be some realignment of those channels. Of course, size will be a consideration, but it's also just the ability to create these alignments of tissue. You don't have that much playroom, as you pointed out earlier in this conversation, with the finger. You know, the digit, the penis that you referenced at the very beginning that was part of this, you know, you don't have that much wiggle room. So where you have some flexibility of inset and where you have a wound bed that has some versatility, doesn't have prior irradiation, you know, where there's actual lymphatic channels that are patent and available, then I think it makes sense. But in certain wound beds, in certain situations where there is no flexibility of inset or not that much, then I think it's probably got its limitations. Yeah, I think those are all really great points. Yeah, absolutely. This has been another awesome discussion, and I think we'll probably end there, but I really want to thank Dr. Janice and my co-resident ambassadors for this conversation. Before we sign off, I just want to remind our listeners uh, to check out the other two September 2018 PRS Journal Club podcasts. And if you like what you hear, please share us with your colleagues and rate us in the Apple iTunes store. Be sure to visit our PRS Facebook page where you can follow the journal and join us for our monthly Facebook Journal Club where you can interact with each month's featured authors in real time. And once again, uh, a big thank you to Dr. Janice for being our guest moderator this month. Thank you. Thank you.